Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Christianity A&E. This is week four, looking at the evidence for Christianity and the Bible. Um, for those of you who haven't joined us in the previous weeks, um, we've not covered a lot, really. Um, week one, we just looked at the scientific evidence for God and the fact that, you know, the universe has been, the scientific evidence the universe has been created. Week two was just looking at the fact that, you know, evil and suffering point to a God because it shows that there is a moral law and a moral law giver. And last week we covered 4,000 years of history showing the Old Testament's true. So, like I say, not a lot. So, um, we are continuing looking at evidence for the Bible. So, what we're going to be doing tonight is looking at the eyewitness testament. So, question. Large word for me. Do you trust the New Testament? Who here trusts the New Testament? Quite a few people. Um, question. Why? Why do you trust it? We have a growing number of people, skeptics of the New Testament, who people like Bart Ehrman, who wrote this book, which is called How Jesus Became God, in which he says, Jesus started out as a very simple guy, like a teacher, but then over time, stories got built up around him, this myth grew, and instead of the simple teacher who he was, over time he became deified and all this legend got attached to him. Bart Ehrman himself says that in the entire first century, Christian century, Jesus is not mentioned in a single Greek or Roman historian, religious scholar, politician, philosopher, or poet. His name never occurs in a single inscription, and it is never found in a single piece of private correspondence. Zero zip references. We're going to be examining if that is true, but it does raise a question. Did Jesus actually exist? We have quite a few people now who deny Jesus ever existed. They say, well, what Jesus is is just like copying other ancient gods, just muddled together. Is that true? Well, according to Bart Ehrman again, he says, there is no doubt the historical Jesus is the most important person in the history of Western civilization. So Bart Ehrman, who is a skeptic, admits Jesus existed. So, we're going to be trying to find out who the real Jesus is. So, we're going to be looking at the evidence. Now, there's two types of evidence any policeman will have. Direct evidence or indirect evidence or circumstantial evidence. Has anyone heard the phrase circumstantial evidence? Who thinks it's a good term? Who thinks it's a negative term? Direct evidence is eyewitness testimony. Indirect evidence or circumstantial evidence is everything else. If you have DNA evidence, that's circumstantial evidence. If you have fingerprints, that's circumstantial evidence. If you have CCTV footage, it's circumstantial evidence. We've got this idea of circumstantial evidence being something negative because of what we've seen in movies like police shows like Columbo, where it's like, well, you've only got a circumstantial case. And then at the end of the episode, Columbo still has a circumstantial case. But he gets a conviction. So, do we have direct evidence for the Bible? We've got an urgent appeal going out for eyewitnesses. Do we have any? Well, Peter says, For well, we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. The gospel writers are being very clear. This is not something which they made up. They actually saw these events take place. This is a painting of the Council of Laodicea. This is where the canon of the gospels got decided. So this is where like, the early Christians met up and they decided what the canon of scripture was going to be. This is the actual building where it, they met. Next slide. 
That's what it looks like today. Um, but this occurred in 363 AD. Jesus dies in the first century. The canons decided in the fourth century. Now that's a bit of a problem. So why do the Christians wait all that time, like 300 years, to decide what the canon is? Um, this painting kind of sums up why. The early Christians were being heavily persecuted up until the time of Constantine. Um, this shows several things which did happen to Christians. They were fed to lions. Here you can see that Christians were used as torches. Um, what the Romans used to do was line the street up with Christians and then they would set them on fire to light the streets for people. We have writings that um, a lot of Christian books were burnt, a lot of manuscript evidence was lost during these times because Christianity was um, considered legal. So could the early church fathers have met before this time? Not really. But it raises the question, when were the Gospels written? We have the resurrection here, which I've dated at Sunday, the 2nd of May, 28 AD. Bit of an earlier date than some. I can't go into all of that, but there's another reason. There's two reasons I'm doing it. One, that's the actual day I think that the tomb was discovered empty. Two, it pushes this back as far away from that as possible. I'm not wanting to make this easy on myself. So, Council of Laodicea, 363, resurrection, let's say around 30 AD. So at what point are the Gospels written? Because if they're written close to the council, then they're outside the time frame of eyewitnesses or anyone who could refute the claims. But if they're close to here, then we are dealing with eyewitness testimony. So let's have a look at the evidence. This is the oldest non-disputed fragment of the New Testament. It's a portion of the Gospel of John which everybody agrees is the last gospel to be written. Now, carbon dating on this places it between 90 AD and 150 AD. Most scholars say 120. Like I say, this is the, uh, the earliest non-disputed. There are earlier ones, but they are disputed. This is not the original. We do not have the original of any of the books in the New Testament. This is a copy. Well, that means that if we've got a copy in 120, and this is found in Egypt, we've got a copy, not found in Israel, in Egypt, of John's Gospel in 120, that means the original must be earlier. So how much earlier? If we look at some of the writings of the early church fathers, we see Polycarp. In his writings, um, in around 110 AD, he, lists, he quotes these books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 2 Theologians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Hebrews, 1 Peter, and 1 John. Those books must exist before that time frame to quote them. We've got Ignatius. He's writing in 107 AD. He mentions Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John, 3 John, and the book of Revelation. And we also have Clement, who's writing in Rome, 95 AD, in the first century. And he mentions Matthew, Mark, Luke, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, 1 Timothy, Titus, Hebrews, James and First Peter. So clearly, all these books existed in the first century, because how is the guy in the first century going to be quoting them or mentioning them? This is an autobiography of the Beatles. Now, this autobiography, it is, as you can see, it is you know fully authorised. Mentions all the history of the Beatles growing up. It leaves a few things out though. It doesn't mention the death of George Harrison. It doesn't mention the death of John Lennon. It doesn't even mention the Beatles splitting up. The book ends with the Beatles are now preparing to write their next album. What can we conclude about this autobiography from the things it misses? Yes? It's written before. This is dated to 1968, before any of those events happened. So that's why it doesn't mention them. So, are there things in the New Testament which should be there, but which are missing 
for some strange reason. Well, in around 68 AD, we have the destruction of the temple. Who knows which book in the New Testament mentions the destruction of the second temple? Struggling? There's a reason you're struggling. Not a single one mentions it. Now, there are some reasons they might want to mention it. So here is um, a monument built to commemorate the destruction of the Second Temple. So, as you can see, the Romans were quite pleased about this. Um, and if you go to the next slide, we can see that they've carved on the wall them carrying away artifacts. So you can see, like, this is the menorah from the temple, all the golden artifacts. Now, it's surprising that none of the New Testament writers mention this, because on the next slide, we can see Jesus predicts it. So Jesus has had a, it's the week he's going to die, he's had a heated debate with the religious leaders, to put it mildly. As he's leaving, the disciples decide to lighten the mood a bit and change the subject. So it says, then as some, some spoke of the temple and how adorned and beautiful the stones and Dutch uh, the nations, he said, these things which you see, the day will come when which what, not one stone shall be left upon another, that all shall be thrown down. So they're like saying, oh, um, oh isn't it nice and beautiful, like all the, the decorations are doing the temple, like the renovation work that's going on, isn't it good? He's like, and he says, yeah, it's going to be completely destroyed. Now, the disciples hear this on the Temple Mount, and from the other gospel accounts, the next time they speak to Jesus is on, is like five miles away. They're silent, they're stunned by this. If you remember like 9-11, this for them is worse. This is the destruction of the temple, it's the entire destruction of Israel. This is a huge thing which Jesus is talking about. Now, Jesus mentions it, mentions it, which some people say, well, that proves the Gospels are written after the fact. But none of the writers of the New Testament, Paul, Peter, James, John, none of them say, hey, look, Jesus was right. They never mention it. We have the prediction, but we don't have a single person saying, look how right Jesus was about this. But the temple wasn't just destroyed. What happened before was the city of Jerusalem was laid siege to. It was surrounded by the Roman army. They didn't let a single person in or out. This lasted two, three years. When the gospel writers talk about suffering and people in Jerusalem who are suffering and need help, they never mention this stuff. It's always religious persecution. It's never, yeah, people in Jerusalem need help because they're being starved to death. Jesus again predicts this. He says, on the next slide, um, we can see he says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, when you know that its desolation is near, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not none of those who are in the country enter her. But these are the days of vengeance. All the things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and the wrath upon this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away into captivity into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The disciples say, when is this going to happen? And Jesus says, this generation. What's the length of the generation? Forty years. Forty years later, this happens. I'm going to summarize the next slide. I'm going to put it up. It is a bit distressing. This is a quote by Flavius Josephus about how bad the situation was in Jerusalem. It tells about a woman who was so hungry, she had a baby, and she said, well, what's the point of you staying alive just to be captured, put into slavery, or starved to death, so she kills her own baby, roasts it, and then eats half of her own baby. Then some people come by and smell the meat and say, you're holding out on food, give us the food, and she produces the baby and says, look, if you want the other half, I've saved it for you. But this is my baby, I'm the one who killed it. I mean, this is a shocking event, this shows how bad the Romans were at this time. Not a single mention of any of this in the New Testament. Would they really leave this type of thing out? Something else which they mention, 
Not a single book in the New Testament mentions the death of James, Peter, or Paul. Now, the book of Acts, um, which is written by Luke, is a history of the early church. The three main characters in the book of Acts are James, the brother of Jesus, Peter, the apostle, and Paul. At the end of Acts, Paul's under house arrest in Rome. He's still alive. Peter's still alive. James is still alive. I mean, the fact that they mention James, because James' death is mentioned by Josephus, it's a huge event. It leads to, James's death leads to the high priest of the temple being fired by the emperor of Rome. That's how big this is, but no one mentions it. Why not? I mean, we know when they died and how they died. Um, go to the next slide. It says that Peter was killed in 65 AD. Tradition says he was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded in Rome in 64 AD. James, thrown from the Temple Mound, he was still alive, so then they beat him to death. That happened in 62 AD. The book of Acts doesn't mention any of this. No New Testament writer does, so what can we conclude? We could also have a look in Acts because the last 16 chapters of Acts, Luke does something rather interesting. The first 16 chapters, he first few chapters, he talks about like, you know, the disciples did this, they did this, they did this. The last 16 chapters, he starts saying, we did this, then we went here. And this is the time when Luke starts traveling with Paul. So the last part of the book is all their travels, and he mentions some facts in there which historians have looked at, and these facts have all been collaborated. We've got some eyewitness testimony here. We've got like eyewitness facts which archaeologists have confirmed. So how many facts we've got? Well, we've got 10 there. We've got another 10 there. There. Then we've got another 10 here on the next slide. Then we've got another 10 here on the next slide. We've got another 10 here on the next slide. We've got another 10 here. Another 10. And we've got another four. So we've got 84 facts. Now these are things like the depth of water, which way you would go, you'd travel to get in between places, the slang words used in different locations, people's names who historians didn't know if they existed until they found archaeological evidence for them, the, na- the titles of officials. Luke gets it absolutely right. Like I say, we've got 84 just in the last 16 chapters. William M. Ramsey is a historian. He started um, doing investigations into the book of Acts. He was highly skeptical of Luke when he started. He thought it was all made up. But then after investigating, he said this quote. Next slide. Not that far. Luke is a historian of first rank. This author should be placed along the greatest historians. So a complete skeptic, after looking at the evidence, said, okay, yeah, this guy's an eyewitness. This guy knows his stuff. So we can very conservatively place Luke writing the book of Acts around 57, 60 AD. Now, in the very first chapter, Luke says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all things Jesus began to do and teach. Can anyone guess what former book Luke's referring to? Luke. It wasn't a trick question. (laughs) So Luke writes the Gospel of Luke before Acts, and we've dated Acts to about 57, 60 AD. So how much earlier is it? Well, Paul quotes the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to say something controversial here, and some people may disagree with me, but I'm going to say it. I think that Paul wrote all his letters before he died. Just just my opinion. You can't back it up, but 
foe. In 1 Timothy, which is one of his later writings, we see that Paul writes this. Next slide. The elders who direct the affairs of the church are well worthy of double honor, especially those who work in preaching and teaching. Um, for Scripture says, so this is important, Paul is now going to say what he considers Scripture. Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. So what is he quoting here? He's quoting two books. The first one, Do Not Muzzle an Ox While Treading Out Its Grain, is Deuteronomy, one of the books of Moses. The second one is Luke chapter 10, verse 7, The Worker Deserves His Wages. Paul is saying to Timothy, he considers at this point the Gospel of Luke not only to be Scripture, but Scripture on the same level as Moses. Now, Paul's a Pharisee. For a Pharisee to say this is something on the same level is crazy. I mean, but it just shows that how important the Gospel of Luke was. Luke, Paul also quotes Luke again. Here we've got the different accounts of what Jesus says um, when at the Last Supper when he's blessing the bread and wine. So, for example, Matthew says, while eating the bread, he gave thanks, and he says, take, eat, this is my body. He gives him the cup, and he says, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Mark, he says, Jesus says, take it, this is my body, and this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Luke says, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then this is the cup of the new covenant which is poured out for you. In 1 Corinthians, which is written 10 years before his letter to Timothy, Paul mentions to the Corinthians, remember how I taught you to do the Lord's Supper. This is how I taught you. When did he teach them? He taught them years earlier. But he's quoting, here's how I taught you, remember how I taught you all those years ago, and he quotes the Gospel of Luke. None of the other Gospels mention, do this in remembrance of me. It's a direct quotation of Luke. So as we can see here on the next slide. Again, it's he's basically word for word quoting Luke in 1 Corinthians. So again, conservatively, we can say Luke around about 53 to 57 AD. Now Luke says in the first chapter of Luke, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who at first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that have been taught to you. J. Warner Wallace is a cold case homicide detective from America, and he talks about this passage, and he says, as a detective, you look for words which people don't have to use, or words which they don't use. Every single word is important. So, for example, if I was out with Anne, and I introduced Anne, I said, hi, this is Anne, that says one thing. If I said, this is my wife, Anne, that says something else. If I say, this is my gorgeous wife, Anne, that says something. If I say, this is a ball and cane, that gets me a black eye. But there's certain words here, things which Luke is saying, which he doesn't have to say. So first he says that there are several people who have taken up to write an account. He's saying, mine's not the first. He's also saying the fact that there's eyewitnesses and that he's interviewed these eyewitnesses. And then he says, I too decided to write an orderly account. What does he need an orderly account? Well, an orderly, the Greek word which is translated, means in chronological order. So he's saying, I too decided to write an account, and I'm doing it in chronological order. 
you were writing the account of life of Jesus, wouldn't you have seen this in chronological order? So why is Luke saying this? He's saying this because, as Papias tells us, Mark became Peter's interpreter and wrote accurately all that he remembered, not indeed in order of the things the Lord had done. So Mark is writing everything which Peter teaches. Now, Peter is teaching in themes. So Peter thinks of a theme, and he'll take several things which Jesus says on that theme, and he'll put it together. So everything he's writing is completely accurate, but it's not necessarily in the right chronological order. So who is Mark to Peter? We have this quote about from 1 Peter. She who is in Babylon, cursing together with you, send you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. So is Mark Peter's biological son? Probably not, but Peter considers him as close as a son. This is how close Mark is. So, guess which gospel Luke quotes more than any other? He quotes Mark. But he puts Mark in correct chronological order, along with the other eyewitness sources. Now, the thing about Mark's gospel as well is, Mark's gospel is strange in that it leaves certain key players unnamed. So, for example, um, Mark says, Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear, the famous event which happened when they came to arrest Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. Mark does not name the man who cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. He also does not give the servant's name. John, in his gospel, says it was Peter who attacked Malchus. So why does Mark not name them? Some have said, well, maybe this shows, like, you know, at the time, like, the Gospels are evolving and changing. Or, maybe Mark was trying to protect Peter. While John, who wrote his Gospel later, may have been writing after Peter died, at which point it doesn't matter if you say who it was or not. Something else which Mark leaves out is, on the next slide, They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, and the elders and teachers of the law came together. At no point does Mark name the high priest. We know it's Caiaphas, because every single other gospel tells us. Why doesn't Mark name Caiaphas? I mean, this isn't something which is to protect anyone. So why not name him? Well, Caiaphas was one of the longest serving high priests. He served from from 18 AD to 36 AD. Mark might not have named him, he might have just said the high priest, because it's possible Caiaphas was still high priest at the time. So why would you name him? It's like someone like saying, well, you know, yeah, they interviewed the prime minister. You'd know who they're talking about. Whereas if someone like was talking about the Iraq war, and it's like, well, they interviewed the prime minister, it's like, well, which two? Because other writers, later writers, would say, well, they interviewed Tony Blair, who was prime minister at the time. So we can put Mark conservatively, again, based on this evidence, on the next slide, around 45 to 50 AD. So we're now talking about 15 years. So we're not looking at the gap which we saw before of like, you know, centuries between the New Testament writers, we're talking about within the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, people who could come along and say, well, actually, no, that didn't happen. So, question. We've got an odd one out here, because we know Matthew comes between those two, but what about John's Gospel? We've got the fragment which dates back to 120 AD. John's Gospel is clearly written before then. How earlier before that point? Well, like the book of Acts, John's got some eyewitness testimony. He's got some facts which, again, haven't been discovered until recent times. So we've got 10 here. We've got another 10. We've got another 10. One more. We've got... Next one, 10 more. And we've got 
29 more. 59 eyewitness facts from the book of John. And John's gospel is very strange because when John's talking, he's talking about the temple as if it's still there. He's like saying, yeah, if you go to the temple and you walk south of the temple and you go to this point, it's like, wait, the temple's destroyed. What are you on about? So what are some of the things he describes? He describes, for example, the Pool of Bethsaida. That's the Pool of Bethsaida. This wasn't discovered until like the 19th century. So John's writing about this, and people are like, well, what are you on about? Again, until they found it. So this is a model of Jerusalem um, here. This is the temple, Pool of Bethsaida is located around this area. Again, when they discovered it, they read the Gospel account of John, they looked at the archaeology. John's describing the building accurately. He also mentions the Pool of Siloam, the sent one. This is where um, Jesus sends the man who was born blind to wash his eyes and he regained his sight. Um, it also says this is the pool where, like, you know, the waters bubbled up and archaeologists have discovered the reason why. There's like certain parts of the Gospels where it's mentioned about one of these two pools and it says in brackets, because it's an editor's note, um, an angel came down and bubbled up the water, which isn't in the original. It's just, it mentions the water bubbles up and people jump in expecting to be healed. A later editor thinks, what's he on about bubbling water? Uh, maybe it was an angel. No, we know why. It, it bubbled up from cisterns. But the fact he knows where the pool is, the fact that people used to do that, and the fact the pool bubbles up, again, it's eyewitness testimony. So there's another view of it. And again, we've got the temple there, full of Shilohims, round about this area. So we can conclude, again, John's Gospel, written before the destruction of the temple. So... Here's dates we can assign to the Gospels. Resurrection around 28 AD, Mark's Gospel, 45, 50 AD, Matthew, around about 46, 52, Luke, 50 to 53, Acts, 57 to 60 AD, John's Gospel, somewhere between 60, 68 AD, before, just before the destruction of the temple. Well within the lifetime of any other eyewitnesses who could have refuted the claims. So, what can we conclude? The Gospels are written incredibly close to the event. They are not written centuries later as some people would hope they were. This is too early for any kind of invention to creep in. And if anyone did try and invent anything, there would have been people at the time saying, no, that's not right. We don't have anyone correcting these guys. So we're going to take a five minutes break now. Okay, let's gear up. Okay, so we've established that the Gospels are written early, but question, isn't 15 to 40 years after the event still too late to start writing the Gospels? You know, why not write earlier than this? A um, few reasons. One, at the time there was a very strong oral tradition, so people could memorize the sayings. Um, the disciples were quite busy. Um, the Gospels start getting written around the time that um, the disciples start getting martyred. So it's around this time that people who were eyewitnesses start being killed and starting with martyrs like, okay, we best get this written down because the disciples are all marked men. Let's get down what they've written before they're killed too. But is it really that late to be writing something? I mean, can you remember stuff which happened like 15 years ago? To put it in context, anyone remember when Saddam Hussein got arrested? 15 years ago. If I was to ask you some details, if I say, okay, well, who was the Prime Minister at the time? Apartheid. And so do you remember like seeing the images on TV? Yeah, I remember that. It's not really that long. I mean, if I, there's certain events which we can all remember. Who remembers 9-11? Who remembers where they were? Who remembers where they were when Princess Diana died? If you remember those events, if you saw someone resurrected from the dead, would you remember it? Well, let's compare the Gospels in this regard. Alexander the Great, great military leader, um, 
we have a problem with Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great died in June of 323 BC. The histories of Alexander the Great is the only ancient Latin biography, well, it's the, actually the only ancient biography we have, um, of Alexander the Great, was written by the Roman historian Quintus Curtius Rufus in the first century AD, and the earliest surviving manuscript we have dates from the ninth century. Everything we know about Alexander the Great is written down 300 years after he dies, and we know all what that manuscript says from a copy which then comes 800 years later. But does anyone know what is the earliest part of the New Testament? Can anyone guess? Might not be what you think. No, it's not Revelation. Not 1 Thessalonians. It is actually 1 Corinthians 15. Paul gives the creed to the Corinthians. Now, this creed is what he says here is, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Remember, Paul was raised a Pharisee. This is rabbinic speak. What this means is, this, we find this in first century literature, um, Jewish literature. It basically means, what I was given was so precious, I passed it on to you without altering a single thing about it because it was so important. That's what that means. And he says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Kephas, who's Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. This is a creed of the early church. So it's something which Paul, as he says, he didn't invent this. This was something which was given to him. So when was he given this creed? There's two possibilities. When he converted Christianity, which is about one to two years after the resurrection, or when he met with Peter and James in Jerusalem five years after the resurrection. Now, the later dating is what Bart Ehrman would say. Um, this visit is one of the most likely places where Paul learned all the received traditions that he refers to, and even the received traditions that we otherwise suspect in his writings that he does not name as such. So, five years at the latest, after the resurrection, Paul receives this creed. The fact it's a creed means it takes time for a creed to come together. It's basically... If someone's meeting someone for the first time, it's like, well, what do you Christians believe? We believe this, 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 and this. Over time, it gets put into this, condensed into this pure form, which is the creed. So, when was this written? Um, historian James Dunn says, this tradition, we can be entirely confident, was formulated as tradition within months of Jesus' death. This isn't years later. Within a few months, we have this creed. Um, Gerard Ludman, who is um, an atheist, says about the discovery of the dating of this creed, is one of the greatest achievements in recent New Testament scholarship. So what does this creed say? That Christ died for our sins, was raised from the dead on the third day, he appeared to more than 500 at the same time. Now, think about this. If Paul is making this up, why would you? That is a bold move to say, to list specific people and say he appeared to more than 500 people at the same time. And you know what? You can go and talk to most of them. Some have died, but most of them are still here. If you don't believe me, ask them. If he's making it up, that's a bold move. But, like I say, we know that the original Gospels now, and this creed in particular, um, are extremely early, especially for ancient writing. But how do we know they've not changed? Here we've got a list. Oh, next slide. This is the gap in years between original ancient books being written and the earliest copy we have. So, for example, we've got Pliny, 
750 year gap. Caesar's writing, 1,000 years. Tacitus, 1,000 years. Plato, 1,200 years. Herodotus, 1,400 years. Demostites, 1,400 years. The best is Homer, 400 year gap. New Testament, 25 years. Between the original writing and when we have it. Nothing in the ancient world compares to that. These are the best of the best in terms of these dates. So let's have a look at the number of documents. So here in orange we have Homer. Homer, he's got about 1,800 manuscripts. He does very well. Everyone else, we've got about 200, 8, 7 in some cases. But like I say, Homer is doing extremely well. So let's add in blue the New Testament documents we have in Greek. There's Homer. There's the New Testament documents just in Greek. We have 5,800 ancient manuscripts written in Greek, which all predate the third century. This is all before the Council of Laodicea. And when you look at these, it's the same as what we've got today. But that's just the Greek manuscripts. We've got more. As soon as the Gospels are written, people start translating them into other languages. So if we add in all those translations into other languages, there's the New Testament, there's Homer, we have 25,300 manuscripts all predating the 3rd century. And this is after the Romans tried to destroy manuscripts. Like I say, the New Testament, we've got an abundance of pictures here. But, again, how do we know like it's not changed? Um, if you're a police officer, let's say you're investigating an old crime and you, you've got like a bullet casing, and you notice a mark on the bullet casing, you think, wait a minute, this might prove who the killer is. Was this on the original? What would you do? You'd follow what they call the chain of custody. Every time that piece of evidence is touched, someone logs it. So the person who finds it will log it. They'll give it to an officer saying, here's what I've received. He gives it to an officer, says, here's what I see, here's what I've got. We've actually got that for the New Testament. So, chain of custody. We've got um, here, Apostle John, about 70 AD. He has a student called Ignatius, about 110. Polycarp around the same time. Irenaeus, 185. Polytus, 200 AD. Their writings all say about Jesus the exact same thing which John does. Says, you know, God came to, you know, save us from our sins, crucified, raised on the third day. Everything, every born of a virgin's in there, everything. Paul, we've got his. So Paul gives to Linnaeus, who gives to Clement, Erastes, Alexander, Sixtus, all the way up to 175. That's where the cane gets broke off there. But again, these guys' writings all agree with everything that Paul says about Jesus. There's not a single change. It's not, it's not like Paul writes something, Linnaeus says, well, as you know, Jesus is just a sinful guy, you know, he didn't perform any miracles. And then by this time, it's like, hey, guess what? He's God. It's consistent throughout the king. We also have Peter. Now, Peter gives to Mark, who gives to Ananias, all the way up to 335 AD, just 30 years before the Council of Laodicea. We've got an entire chain of people who are the disciples of the disciples of the disciples of the disciples of the disciples of, the disciples of Peter. And they all agree with what Peter says. In fact, these guys, when people start questioning them, what they do is something which I'm so glad. If someone would say, say to me, well, well, Jesus, does, did this really happen? What about this? I don't agree with this bit of scripture. I would say, okay, well, listen up. Here, here's why this is right. This, 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 and this. And I would just spew off a load of stuff. These guys are far more clever than I am because what these guys did was they just quoted the scripture. If someone had an argument, they'll say, okay, well, here's what it says in the scripture. So these guys quote scripture. And next slide, we can see. Next one. 
old one? I'm stuck. There we go. You can see, here's the different church fathers. Here's how many times each one quotes the Gospels. How many times they quote Acts. How many times they quote Paul. The other epistles, the book of Revelations. The totals. So even if we didn't have any of those 25,000 New Testament manuscripts, we could reconstruct practically the entire New Testament just using these quotations alone. Four. Aren't, here's a question. Next slide. Aren't the gospel writers biased? I mean, we can't trust what these guys say. Okay, it's written early, but we can't trust them because these are guys who all followed Jesus. You know, they all were friends with him. Of course they're going to say nice things about him. Well, if he was in a court... What's really powerful testimony is enemy testimony. Let's say there's someone who comes to the stand and it's like, do you know the defendant? Yeah, that guy. He um, used to be my best friend, but he um, stole my job. He framed me for something at work, got me fired. He then um, had an affair with my wife. My wife now lives with him in my house with my kids. This guy completely ruined my life. Do you think this guy's guilty? No, he wouldn't do something like that. If you've got someone who is so against someone who then speaks in favor of them, that is quite powerful testimony. Do we have anything like that in the New Testament? Well, we've got James and Saul. So, who's James? James is the brother of Jesus. He did not believe Jesus when he was alive and preaching. He thought he was a lunatic and tried to take him home. He then claimed to have met the resurrected Jesus, became the head of the church in Jerusalem, wrote the book of James, and he's killed for his faith in Jerusalem. Paul, high-ranking Pharisee, you know, very wealthy guy. He thought Jesus was a blasphemer. He persecuted the early church and oversaw the stoning of Stephen. Claimed to have met the resurrected Jesus, became the apostle Paul, wrote about half the New Testament, and is killed for his faith in Rome. So these guys, if you look here... Are they really going to be inclined to believe Jesus? Well, what changes? They claim to have met Jesus resurrected. If you had a friend who, you know, you grew up at school and you absolutely love this friend, and then you saw that friend robbing a bank, you would be a believer that they are a bank robber because you've seen it don't have any bias to think that way. It's You've literally seen it. <laughs> Same with these guys. They're transformed. But what about the other Gospels? Every so often you'll hear about, oh, guess what? They found like a Gospel which should have been included. You know, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of um, whoever. You know, it's like, Judas is a good one. <laughs> um, so can we trust these other Gospels? Should they be included? Well, first problem is, um, these other Gospels are referred to by the early church fathers starting at the end of the 2nd century AD, and they're mentioned in the fact that people say, guess what, there's some forgeries out there, don't trust it. So, here's a question, how do you plagiarise? Now, you plagiarise, I would copy someone else's work and pass it off as my own. But most times, you take your own work and you put a famous name to it. It's like, hey, um, do you want to buy the Gospel according to Alistair? Gospel according to St. Peter, eyewitness, anyone now, thank you, thank you. Same there. So, and we can see this because some people like to say about the gospel writers, like, you know, some people say, well, they're anonymous, but everyone who writes about the gospels names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, if you're trying to make something up, if you're trying to make this up, think about this. You've got Matthew, eyewitness, Mark, not an eyewitness, but he interviewed an eyewitness. Luke, he interviewed eyewitnesses. John, eyewitness. But then you look at these other writings, it's Peter, Thomas, Judas, Mary, all eyewitnesses. If you're trying to pass something off, would you really say, do you want to read an account by, of the life of Jesus? Who wrote it? Well, there's this doctor, he wasn't there, called Luke. Um, he's good. Would you really assign Luke to this? I mean, you've 
obviously we know it's accurate because he interviewed the eyewitnesses. We know how accurately he copied and Mark, we know he got it from Peter. But these later forgeries, they like, you know, really heavily lean on, yeah, guess what? We've got people you know who wrote this. But they also, these later writings fail to do things which the New Testament does accurately. So, for example, here we have popular names cited in Palestinian literature in the first century. Let's say I was asking you to write a book set in France during the Second World War. Would you be able to get the names of characters correct for the time period? If you didn't live there at the time. Because the New Testament, these later writings don't do it. The later writings get the geography of Israel wrong, they get everything wrong basically. But they don't, but the Gospels, we get this. It's like people with the name Simon or Joseph, Palestinian writings 15.6%, Gospels 18.2%. Men with one of my nine most popular names, 41.5%, in the Gospels 40.3%. Men who had a name no one else had, in the Palestinian writings 7.9%, Gospels 3.9%, and so on and so forth. The Gospels are incredibly accurate when it comes to names at the time, including things like. What's Jesus known as? Jesus of Nazareth. Why is he known as Jesus of Nazareth? Because his name in Hebrew is Yeshua, or modern-day Joshua. It's one of the most popular names. So how would you distinguish Jesus from someone else? If you said, oh, have you heard of Jesus? Which one? Well, it's the Jesus from Nazareth. Because Nazareth, only about 100 people live there. Very small community. There's only one guy in Nazareth with that name. Or you'd say, like, Simon, son of Zebedee. Again, that's a, what they'd actually call people. The New Testament gets that 100% correct. But this is like no Jewish writers. Surely, like, Jewish names, no matter where you are in the ancient world, are the same. No. The top Jewish men's names in Israel at the time, Simon, one, Joseph, Eleazar, Judah, Yohanan, Joshua. If you go to Egypt and look at some Jewish people living there, the top name is Eliezer, Sabbatias, Joseph, Isthmus, Patos, I'm not even going to try. Um, but it is completely different, even at the same time. But, I mean, as well, like, you know, these later writings, you talk about exaggeration. Here's how the resurrection of Jesus is described. If you look at the Gospels, they are incredibly simple. When you think about it, it's just like, you know, all the Gospels agree, it's women come to the tomb, find the tomb empty. This is what the Gospel of Peter says. That there was an entire army outside the tomb, as well as all the priests, and most of the people of Jerusalem were gathered outside. At which point, two men descend from heaven, the stone rolls itself away, the two men enter, One of the guards wakes up the high priest and says, hey, guess what's happening? The two men come out of the tomb, at which point their heads reach the heavens, and they're carrying a third man whose head is even higher than the heavens. And then, behind them, the cross walks out the tomb, at which point a voice from heaven says, have you preached unto them that sleep? And then the cross says yes. Why, won't, why don't they have the Gospel of Peter in the New Testament? What do you think? <laughs> it's got a talking cross in it. I mean, but how do we know the New Testament writers are honest? Well, one really good test is embarrassing details. Um, a lot of ancient writers would not include embarrassing details about themselves. We have a, a pharaoh who we know went to war in Africa. He got beat. When he came back, he wrote about his very successful elephant hunt. That's the reason I went. I want to get an elephant. Don't worry about it. Of course, it's going to be a whole army. So, do we have any embarrassing details in the New Testament? Well, what we have is... On the next slide. The 
gospel writers included biting details about themselves. So several times they do not understand what Jesus is saying. They fall asleep several times when Jesus asks them to pray with him, like when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. They make no effort to give Jesus a proper burial. But they record Jesus is buried by Joseph of Arimathea, who is a member of the court who sentenced Jesus to death. Jesus rebukes Peter and calls him Satan. Paul opposes Peter to his face at Antioch. All the disciples run away and hide when Jesus is crucified. All but one, sorry, um, John says. Peter denies knowing Jesus. The disciples are shown as cowards, hiding in fear, while the women stay with Jesus and are the first to discover the empty tomb. I mean, think about this. In that culture, Josephus writes that the testimony of a woman is worth only half that of a man. And yet, what do all the Gospels say? The first people who discover the empty tomb, the most important event in all of Christianity, are women. How embarrassing is this? Remember the creed we saw from Paul? Who does Paul say is the first one Jesus appears to? That he appears to Peter. He didn't mention the women. This is an, at the time, this is an embarrassing fact. Why include it? Because, you know, okay, it's embarrassing, but you know, it was the women. And think about this. If you're a man writing the gospel, yeah, so here's what happened. We were hiding while the women went to the tomb and, you know, or would you be more likely to say, yeah, so what happened was we went down to that tomb. We fought off the guards with our bare hands. We got that stone. We rolled it away. We then comforted the weeping women. And then Jesus came out and says, good work, lads. Good work. No could count on you. Yeah, great times. See, it's... Um, also, um, the disciples doubt Jesus several times. They doubt Jesus when he said, I'm going to rise from the dead. They don't believe him. When they first hear about the resurrection, they don't believe it. And I cannot believe that this passage is in the gospel. Matthew 28, 17. The resurrected Jesus is standing with his disciples and it said, some believed, most believed, although some doubted. Jesus is standing right there, and some of them are like, really? Really? If you're making this up, would you include that passage? That when they see him resurrected, they're like, come off it. But more than embarrassing details about themselves, they include embarrassing details about Jesus himself. Um, they say his family thinks he's out of his mind and try and take him home. His own brothers don't believe him. Many of his, des his followers desert him at times. He turns off the Jews who had believed in him, and they want to stone him. Jesus is called a drunkard. He's called demon-possessed. He's called a madman. He, they record how he has his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which could be seen as a sexual advance. He's crucified, which the Old Testament says... Anyone who's hung on a tree is under God's curse. Why do you include that if you're making it up? I mean, Paul in Galatians then talks about the fact, yes, Jesus is under the curse. He's under the curse for us. But like I say, at the time, it's like hung on a tree, okay, disqualified as being Messiah. But what about contradictions in the Bible? Yeah, some people say, okay, yeah, but the Bible's full of contradictions. How do we deal with this? Well, if you're a police officer and you're interviewing multiple witnesses, these witnesses, their testimony you put together. It creates a whole. It's like having multiple pieces of a puzzle. Um, next slide. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so these different pieces, the, you can imagine each piece is a different testimony of someone. It comes together to create a whole picture. There's a case in America, there was an armed robbery, and the only officer who was available was some distance away. He says, I'm going to be there as quick as I can, keep all the eyewitnesses, I want to speak to all of them. It takes him 30 minutes to get there. He arrives, he's like, okay, where are the eyewitnesses? Um, they're in the van, it was raining, so we thought, put them all together in the van. Now, the officer was extremely upset with this. Why would he be upset about all the eyewitnesses being put in a van together for 30 minutes? Because what, they, what do you think they're doing for 30 minutes? They're talking about what they've just seen. And they're 
And then someone says, well, I saw it this way. And someone contradicts them. Oh, well, maybe it's like that. So what you're left with, from that, the officer was left with puzzles, pieces which all look the same. They're useless to anyone. Same with the Gospels. There's some things which you look at, and then, and it doesn't make sense, but then you look at another Gospel. So, for example, why did people wait until evening to bring those who needed healing to Jesus in Matthew 8.16? We find out in Martin, Mark and Luke, they waited because it was the Sabbath. But they wouldn't have gone before that. In Matthew 14, it records how Herod was telling his servants he thought Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Well, how does Matthew know what Herod is saying to his servants? Well, we find out in Luke and Acts that many of Jesus' followers were from Herod's household. Matthew never mentioned it. But it answers the question raised in Matthew. So, at the feeding of 5,000 in John's Gospel, Jesus says to Philip, where can we get food for all these people? Question, why does he ask Philip? I mean, no offence to Philip, but who's Philip? In the grand scheme of the apostles, you know, why is he not saying, um, Peter, John, why Philip? The answer comes in Luke, because Luke records that this took place at Bethsaida, which is where Philip grew up. Philip is the only one of the disciples who would know where to go. So, um, in Matthew, it says that a maid notices Peter. Why did she notice him? We find the answer in John. The disciples spoke with her when he was brought inside. But there are things which people say are contradictions. So, let's have a look. I'm going to give you some examples, which I think are good examples, which kind of show you how to deal with some of these contradictions. So, for example, question. Who knows what the sign above Jesus' cross said? Anyone? Anyone else? The answer is, it depends which gospel you read. Not a single gospel agrees on this. So, for example, Matthew says, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Mark says, the King of the Jews. Luke says, this is the King of the Jews. John says, Jesus the Nazarene, or Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. How do we solve this? This is a clear contradiction. I mean, these guys can't even agree on what the cross said. So how can you believe it? I'm speaking to you all tonight. Now, let's say that Steve asked me a question, and I answered Steve. One of you might go home and say, Alistair spoke to Steve and said this. Someone else might say, Alistair told us this. Is it a contradiction? No, it's all part of the same puzzle. If we deconstruct what these, what says, so King of the Jews, that's in everything because this is the charge against Jesus. This is why Jesus is being crucified, King of the Jews. So we've got that on all of them. We've got, this is Jesus, Jesus, the King of the Jews. So if we put it all together, what we get is, the sign says, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. If that's the sign, are any of the Gospel writers wrong? No. They're just recording different parts of it. Here's another one which people like. How did Judas die? That's a bit easy. So, Matthew records that um, Judas, he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and he went and hanged himself. In Acts... Peter says, now this man purchased the field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. So, how do we deal with this? Now, some people have suggested, okay, well, what probably happened was, Judas hangs himself, it's quite warm, he rots, the rope then breaks, he falls forward, but gush, gush out everywhere. There we go. That's, that's the solution. Although, this is taking place on Pentecost. Pentecost is 50 days after the resurrection. So would this have happened in 50 days? There's a better explanation. There's what actually happened. 
which is, next slide, hanging with a noose was invented in the 5th century AD. In, when the Bible refers to hanging, it means impaling. So, for example, in the book of Esther, it talks about um, from, um, like if someone's going to be hanged on them, and it means they've erected an impaling spike. So what Jesus does is he doesn't take a noose because that's not been invented yet. He takes a sword, goes to the field which he's purchased, takes a sword, impels himself, falls forward, he's pushed, cut all out. Jesus is hanged because he's nailed to a cross. So ancient writers say Jesus was hanged. It's not a contradiction, it's just knowing correct historical terms. Here's a big one. This is something which if you go to... Um, Israel, they'll have um, rabbis handing out letters and they'll say, you get $10,000 if you can solve this riddle. Using the scriptures show how Jesus is descended from King David. So in Luke, we have from God all the way to Jesus, from Joseph. So Jesus, his father's Joseph, whose father is Heli, and it goes on from there. But then we read in Matthew that, next slide, Joseph is the son of Jacob. And from there, it's completely different. Another question. Is Jesus even related to Joseph? Jesus was born of a virgin. But does he have any biological link to Joseph? No, he doesn't. So how do we solve this? Um, if we look, Matthew gives us a bit of a hint. He says, Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. So here we've got a list of, from Abraham to David. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 generations. And King Solomon, 14 generations. Then we've got the 12th generation, it says Joseph, the husband of Mary, so that's 12th generation. Jesus, 13th generation. Matthew can't add. The tax collector can't add. So how do we solve this? There must be an answer because Jesus has to be the son, the son of David. He has to be, or else he's not the Messiah. Papias tells us that Matthew wrote, composed the words in the Hebrew dialect, and each translated it as he was able. Irenaeus says Matthew also issued a written gospel amongst the Hebrews in their own dialect. Regian says the first um, was written according to Matthew, the same that was once the tax collector, but afterwards emissary of Yeshua the Messiah, who, having published it to the Jewish believers, wrote in Hebrew. So, as we see from Papias, Matthew writes in Hebrew. People translate as best they can. Now, there's a bit of an issue translating Hebrew to Greek because the letters don't quite match up. So what most likely happened was Matthew is translated into Aramaic and then Aramaic to Greek. We see some links there in the text itself of like, you know, quotations in Aramaic. Um, but what we do have is Jewish scribes who are very good at keeping records. God picked the right nation for record keeping. We have at least two writings here of Matthew in Hebrew. This is chapter 1, and if you read it in Matthew chapter 1 in Aramaic, it says, Joseph, the mighty man of Mary, the mother of Jesus who is the Christ. Now, mighty man isn't a superhero. It's um, head of the household. And then, like in the next thing, it says, Mary and her husband, and it clearly says, Mary and her husband, Joseph. So we've got Joseph, the head of the household of Mary. But in Hebrew, it says, here and here, Joseph, the father of Mary, who was the mother of Jesus, who is the Christ. Matthew's account is the lineage of Jesus through his only biological relative, Mary, 
who follows the kingly line of David Solomon. He's the kingly line. Whereas the other gospel account records the history of his father Joseph, who also descended of King David, but not in the royal line. So, if we have a look, this solves the issue. Suddenly, 14 generations, 14 generations, and 12th generation Joseph, 13th generation Mary, 14th generation Jesus. Problem solved. Sometimes you have to, so as we've seen, if you come across a contradiction, sometimes what you have to do is you have to look at all the Gospels to get the full picture, or you have to look at the correct historical context. Sometimes you have to go a bit further, but there are basically no contradictions in the Gospels if you look at them in the correct way. But here's the thing about the Gospels. Were they verified? This is an important test for eyewitnesses because if you claim to have seen something, if you're there, present, that's great, but you need collaborating evidence. Do we have anything like that for the New Testament? I mean, the claims these guys make about Jesus, there would be some evidence left over. Do we have any evidence at all? Find out next week.